Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. And please visit us at barrykibrick.com where you'll see all the ways that you can become a patron of our mission and help us continue to build a community of seekers who quest for knowledge, information, and most importantly, wisdom. What if you could really make the leap of faith it takes to choose your own path to greatness? Hello, I'm Barry Kibrick, and there is no one better than my guest, Valerie Condos Field, to help us make that leap. As head coach of the UCLA women's gymnastics team, she's won seven NCAA championship titles and was just recently named the Pac-12 Coach of the Century. Now with her book, Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance, she brings her coaching wisdom to us so we can quest for our own success. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. Val, I am so excited for you to be here. Welcome to Between the Lines. Thank you for gracing our stage. It's a pleasure. I am so excited to be here. I have watched a lot of what you do, and I am so honored, honestly, to be sitting here in this chair that so many amazing people have sat in, and you sitting there, this is wonderful. Oh, well, we're going to have a great time. I want to start off by saying, although you are the Pac-12 coach of the century, we're not going to get too much into that because this book is not about gymnastics. This book is what I would call the ultimate sport analogy book to a certain sense, where you don't take the sport, but you take the life lessons learned from the sport and you bring them to us. Exactly. And it would have been foolish for for me to write a book about gymnastics, solely about gymnastics, because I've never done gymnastics. I went upside down once. It was two years ago on my 58th birthday, and my friend said it's time that I did a cartwheel. And I did one, and I didn't even get all the way over. It was pathetic. So my knowledge of gymnastics is simply what I've learned being at UCLA as a coach. And this book is literally about all of the life lessons the really tough life lessons that we learn through sport and that you don't learn in the classroom necessarily. And the first tough lesson you had to learn was when you actually became the coach, you drove the team downward and they, they, and the, they wouldn't get rid of you because they just loved your personality. But it wasn't until you really got in touch with another great UCLA legend, John Wooden, that you realized there was another way to go about this. Absolutely. I was, when I was asked to be the head coach, I had majored in history. I wanted to go be a journalist. And they called me and the athletic director called me in her office and said, we're going to make a change and we would like for you to be the new head coach. And I literally looked at her like she was crazy. And I said, I don't know the first thing about gymnastics. And she said, I've, I've noticed how you work with the student athletes. I like how tough you are, but it comes from a tough love perspective, and I trust you'll figure the rest out. And so I did what I thought was prudent, and I mimicked other great coaches. And it wasn't until, as you said, I ran into Coach Wooden's definition of success. I didn't know Coach Wooden at the time. And I picked a book up. It literally fell open to his definition of success, which says success is peace of mind and knowing you have become the best that you are capable of becoming that I realized I had been trying to be somebody else all this time. And you made a realization about trying to be somebody else that I want to say here. Whenever you try to be someone else, you will always be a second-rate them, and worse, you will never become a first-rate you. Right, and that's when I realized okay, if I'm going to stay in this job as the head coach of the UCLA gymnastics team, what do I bring to the table? 
And I went back to my, we didn't have offices, we have cubicles. And I went back to my cubicle and I thought, I have 17 years of classical ballet training. I know what it's like to work through pain. I know what it's like to be a young woman, a girl going through puberty and having to get in a leotard every day as our student athletes have to. And most of all, I knew how to prepare. As Coach Wooden would say, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. But I knew how to prepare emotionally, mentally, and physically to be calm and confident as I was standing in the wings. And I knew that I could teach our student athletes and prepare them well enough so when they were standing in the wings, which is standing there waiting for the judge to salute them to go up on the event, I could prepare them to be calm, enthusiastic, and confident as they were standing there. And I knew I could do that as well, if not better than anybody else. And the reason why is you began to listen to your own voice. We spoke a little bit earlier and I said, you know, that is such great advice, but, and it's such a simple thing to do, but it's not easy to imbibe and, and make it internally yours. That's part of what we learn when we read this as well, is how do we really learn to listen to our voice and what happens when we do? We had a great moment with that, with our sports psychologist, Dr. Bill Parham, years ago. And we were talking about how you, how can you hear your own voice? And he put up on the board in big letters, listen. And then he rearranged those same letters and it spells silent. And it was so impactful for all of us. In order to truly listen, you have got to silence your mind. Well, you say when you do that, you become I intentional with your thoughts yes. and your actions. And that's when you can embrace the power and take responsibility. And yes. I want to make this very clear because when viewers, I, I, I always get concerned that viewers may say, well, I'm trying and I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. Uh, uh, don't blame yourself, but it allows you to take responsibility for your next action. And right. that's the important difference. That's the thing you teach your kids as well. Don't blame yourself, but take responsibility right. for your actions. Right, and I believe it's in the book as well. Um, a great example of that was at the time that we were, I was coining my philosophy. The one thing I want every young student athlete to get coming through our program is to understand that life is about choice. And every single choice you make is starts with your thoughts. And so I think people think that when we talk about you can own your inner voice, you can own your choices, I think they think every choice we make and every thought we have has to be happy. And, and that if we're not, po in, we're not living this 100% positive mindset that we're not doing things correctly. And that's not what I'm talking about in the book. No, you're definitely not. In fact, you're allowing all of the emotions to come and then you guide, once you, this is kind of funny, you, you allow those emotions to flow and then you guide them to the, yes. to the path that they need to go into. Yes, and because I speak a lot with younger athletes, I do a lot of speaking in gyms and I'm talking with 10, 11 year olds. I have come up with this wonderful visual for them to understand this concept and that is anything that happens to you in life you're going to have these thought bubbles pop up and some of those thought bubbles are going to be negative and they're going to be harmful to you but there's going to be a positive thought bubble up there just choose which thought bubble you're going to starve and choose which ones you're going to feed and that will directly impact your life oh and once again it's back to the choice right yes. that's where we started from the beginning take responsibility for that choice because you have a choice to feed and again, viewers, I want you to know, it is still a little bit simple to say, and it still is not as easy to do, but when you do it, yes. you feel that, you feel empowered. Absolutely empowered. And that's all I try to teach our student athletes. Just don't be a victim in life. Just take responsibility for your actions. You know, the, the hardest thing I remember learning growing up was to say, I'm sorry. But when you do really learn how to say that and mean it, it is so, it releases you 
from all of this heavy burden you're carrying. And so when I have a student athlete come to me, an 18 year old say, Ms. Val, I'm sorry. I say, thank you so much for your apology, I appreciate it. And then she'll say, no, Ms. Val, really, I'm sorry. And I'll say, I, I accepted your apology. Thank you, let's move on. And they don't understand that once you've apologized, it's done. We get to move on now. And I'm not gonna bring it up again. So don't you bring it up again. Oh, I, I, I must tell you, I, I did a whole show on being the great apologizer. No, because you know what? There, it is such a relief to unburden yourself. It it's, and I always say this too, and it's not that I made this up, but I've heard it as well. It's much better to do what you think is right and then apologize if right. it's wrong than not to take the chance and do it. Right, not to be courageous to take that step. Because how boring is life if you don't tap into your courage and do new things? Well, you even say, for, I'll use your exact words, for magic to happen, you need trust. And I'm going to make that leap of faith that trust is part of listening to that voice. Trust is part of, if you're coaching, do you trust that coach? But for magic to happen, you must have this trust. Right. Otherwise, it's just your life is like that. And I see this in, you know, we, we talked about, started talking about owning your own voice and being true to who you are. I think it's so difficult, especially for the, this younger generation who's never not had a smartphone. And all they do all day long is compare themselves to other people. And the ones that I really see on our team that are living full lives, they have discarded that phone for the majority of their day. And they are outside even, even just taking walks because we, we now know that even just walking stimulates the creative side of your brain. I had, a, I had a young girl come to my office the other day. She goes, Ms. Val, I went for a 45 minute walk. I can't believe how much clarity I have right now. Versus sit, and she said, versus sitting in my dorm room scrolling through social media. Well, you know why? Because she reversed that listen to silent. silent. And that's when you're walking, you're silent. I find the same thing with exercise. It allows you to take yourself out of your mind because you're focusing on what you have to do. That's, a, a, and I guess for almost every athlete, that must be the first thing they have to do. They have to take out of their mind their, at their, their last performance that may not yeah. have been good, the putt that may not have gone in, the catch they may not have made, falling off the balance beam. You have a story how one of your athletes was able to compose themselves and go back on with the routine. And almost, I don't think she got the 10, but I think she got like a 9.9 mm -hmm. .9 or something mm -hmm. because of that ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the greatest quotes that I remember in my career was Tyus Sedney, who's currently one of our basketball coaches. He was a great athlete for us in basketball. And he came in our gym one day. He says, Miss Val, you have the toughest sport. And I said, why? And he says, because there's nobody to pass the ball to. Oh, and I wow. love that metaphor for life. You know, when our student athletes, when my gymnasts are up on the beam and they start getting nervous, you can't just stop and pass the ball and say, finish for me, please. Wow, you have another thing that I think, and, and, and I, if I'm correct, this may even tie in how you met John Wooden. I'm not sure, I, 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 I just don't remember. But you said the art of the ask mm -hmm. is one of the most important skills to master, the art of the ask. Absolutely, and I start the book off with the explanation that um, I was dancing, I was starting my first season with Washington DC Ballet, and I heard that UCLA needed a dance coach for their gymnastics team. And my dream was to go to UCLA, and I'd not gone to college yet. I was 22 years old, and without any hesitation, I found out who the head coach was, got the number, called them up, gave them my resume, and they said, we don't have a salary, but we have a full scholarship to offer you if you would like to come to UCLA. And I look at my career, 36 years, all of this experience, all of these relationships like with John Wooden that I've had and <clears throat> the, the championships and all of that, none of that would have happened had I been afraid to ask. And the reason why I wasn't afraid to ask was because I grew up with parents. I did not grow up with an a understanding of failure. 
You know, in, in athletics, you hear that term fear of failure a lot. I don't believe the word failure exists. And I didn't grow up with parents who made me feel like I was failing if I didn't achieve something. And so I was at UCLA. I married our defensive coordinator for football who knew Coach Wooden. And I literally nagged my husband until he invited Coach Wooden over for dinner. And that is how I got a relationship with one of the greatest, not just coaches, but human beings I've ever met. Oh, you know what? I, I am so blessed. He graced our stage. And there, he's one of those gentlemen that when you, when you meet, there's an aura, literally an aura around them. I know that sounds no, too is. mystical and spiritual or whatever, but there is an aura around they John were. Wooden. And I, you know what? As I meet you, you have a very, you have a, I don't, you're, you're not John Wooden, you're, you're Val, <laughs> Miss Val, but you have that same thing and your, your team knows it. Thank you very much. That's a tremendous compliment. You know, they used to call, some people called him St. John and he hated that. They called him the Wizard of Westwood and he hated that because there was no magic to it. There was a plan and there was hard work in working the plan. So, but that aura that you're talking about with Coach Wooden came from him being so true to himself and his faith. Ah, oh, see, that's it. When you, you talk about authenticity in the book, being true to yourself. And again, mm -hmm. though, it's, it would seem like the simplest thing to do, but it's so, at least for me, it's hard. But didn't you come to a point in your life where it was easier? Because I yes. was... Oh, yes. Oh, no, like, no. I, my 40s were fabulous. And then in my 50s now, it's like, I feel like Betty White. I just feel like I can do whatever I want and say whatever I want as long as it's true, authentic, and not hurting someone else. You know, that's though not my issue. I must tell you, I feel that I can do very easily. It's really just still feeling comfortable within my own skin. I think that might be the term that I, I, I feel sometimes uncomfortable within my own skin. And I will say it does improve with does. time and age. It does. It also improves with um, <clears throat> life experiences and when I was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, you can't go through anything like that without it truly changing you. And one thing that I remember experiencing was there were days that I was down and sad, and that was okay. I didn't want to pretend like I wasn't. I didn't wallow in it, but it was okay for me to just get in my pajamas and go home and knit and just be, have some solitude. That was okay. You know, we're going to explore that a little bit later in our segment called Afterwards because I have so much to cover here, but I want to save that because there's something you do that I want to share with my viewers and they'll catch it online. But I think it almost ties in to this next thing I'm about to bring up because you say, say it, know it, own it. And that's part of the thing you did even when you were treating when you were being treated for the breast cancer. You've got to say it, you've got to know it, you've got to own it. Yes, and owning it is the scary part because I think we all think that we have to be right when we own something that we do. And it's, I feel it's, it's better, it's okay, and it's actually a better life experience when we go for something and we own it and then we realize that you know what, maybe I shouldn't have done it that way, or maybe I should not have said that. And then we come back, and if we need to apologize, and shift gears, and then move forward with another action that we're owning. That's, that's called life. You have a phrase that I love, and I actually used it in a show years ago. I'm not even gonna tell you where I got it, but I'm gonna say what it is that you wrote. It's act as if. When you act as if, you take control and make your story conscious, even if you don't feel it's your default mode at that moment, act as if. That's something I have been able to do. I preach as well. And please let our viewers know why that's so important. Well, I think that the, a big important part of the act as if is don't mis mistake, mistake, 
mistake. That for mimic someone else. Act as if. And so I first started contemplating that when I was a when I was dancing, a ballet dancer, and I went through the weight gain period and all of this. And it was because I wasn't acting as if I was a healthy athlete. And so instead of trying to mimic the principal dancer, the skinny blonde with the long legs, who was literally living off of licorice and Diet Coke, I acted as if I was a healthy classical ballet dancer. And that's how I changed my diet. Not from thinking of it as a diet, oh, but as I was acting as if I was healthy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Now, now I gotta throw out the licorice <laughs> and go to that. Okay, all right. Now, but part of this whole thing though is what you call discovering your default. And I wanna actually say why this is important. Well, actually, I'm gonna read your words, so okay. it's why you say it's important. The important ingredient in honing your default is to hit the proverbial refresh button over and over and over throughout the day. So uh, this is where, again, I think the viewers will really get it that, wait a minute, once you discover it, that doesn't mean it's over. You no. gotta keep pressing that reset button because you're gonna keep falling into the same trap over and over again. Everyone does, but that's okay. Know where it is, press that default button, refresh, right. start again. I think the refresh button is such a simple concept but it's something that if we're living fully, we do it subconsciously. We hit that, like, I think most of us hit that refresh button on kindness over and over and over again. Because I know myself, I'm a very sarcastic sense of humor that can get snarky. Oh, I know, you've been picking on me in the green room about my <laughs> accent all day, so go ahead. Uh, there continue. are R's in certain <laughs> words. <laughs> Not, not in my vocabulary. Get those R's out of here. Um, see? Right. And so I have to hit my refresh button, especially, I know, um, it, honestly, if someone was sensitive like you about your accent. No, I'm not. I know you're not. I know. I said like you, you're right. Like you have an accent. Right. But if I, you can tell if you're bristling someone. Inside, I'm going to hit my refresh button. Just stop talking, Valerie. Just stop it. Um, but with, especially with our athletes, we train at 7:45 in the morning. They're usually, e at least emotionally spent, if not physically. They're in school. They're in they're a tough university, doing a tough sport. And I have come in and I'll just start throwing sarcasm out at them and. One time, my whole team sat me down and just said, Miss Val, we know that you don't mean to be intentionally um, mean and annoying, but your sarcasm is. And I was like, <laughs> the proverbial mir mirror was up like this. And I was going, okay, now, well, now what am I gonna do with this? I guess I don't get to be snarky anymore. Well, I'm gonna show you something because this is the thing that I bolded and made in big print. I won't show it to the audience because they're gonna see it in a second. <laughs> <laughs> embrace, embrace the suck. Yeah. Now, if there's, I came away with that, and as I said, I, I, I put that in such big letters, I, I, I it, please show us how to embrace the suck and what you mean by that. Well, that's a military term, so I did not coin that term, but it was, uh, the, a beautiful story came out of the gentleman that helped me write the book, Steve Cooper, and I asked him one day, he, he called me and I said, what were you doing? And he said, I was golfing. I said, how'd you do? He says, I did horribly. And I said, okay. And he says, but I've learned to embrace the suck. He says, I don't have time to take golf lessons. I don't have time to go out and practice as much as I would like to. So I can either embrace the suck because I love being outdoors. I love being with my friends and I actually really enjoy the game. I can embrace sucking right now until I have time to practice more, or I can stop. Val, we are out of time. I, I, I can't believe how fast it went. We're going to do the afterwards segment, as that. I said it before, but we'll do it in a moment. But I'm gonna end with these words because that's how I'm gonna begin the next segment. And you mentioned it earlier. Be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things. Miss Val, as your athletes affectionately call you, I want to thank you so much for gracing our stage, and I want to end with these words, 
Be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things. And I am so grateful you joined us. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you for joining us. We're going to be following up on the theme of be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things when Ms. Val and I discuss her winning battle with cancer in our afterwards segment. You can catch it right after this episode at barrykibrick.com. But before you do, I would like to leave you with these few more words from Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance. Bravo to all of you who dare to do you. You not only help make our world more exciting and colorful, but you also set an example for those who are still fearful of stepping out of accepted norms and into the unknown and often scary world of being different. I'm Barry Kibrick. Dare to be different. Dance between the unknown and you just might find it not too scary at all. Thank you, Ms. Val. Thank you. My pleasure. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com.